Oh, welcome everybody back to the Independent Investor Channel for another uh, reaction video to the uh, ACT Expo that just uh, concluded in Long Beach, California. I thought it was very telling. Uh, I was uh, able to review for you guys and actually time stamped the uh, panel um, that I thought was the most telling of the Expo for sure. So uh, I spent a lot of time actually uh, leaving the timestamps in the bottom of that. I think really for context, you really do need to listen to the hour and a half panel um, in its totality because there's a few key moments that we will talk about uh, in this video. Uh, but we're going to go in and we're going to jump into the, the really the six segments and we're going to break it down. For you guys, uh, we're going to listen to Thomas Healy, and I'm going to uh, allow my commentary or offer my commentary a little bit about uh, how I think that this was just a slam dunk. Um, you know, the, the reaction of the stock was um, uh, predictable, no doubt about it. I think every day that goes by, I think it's creating one of the best value opportunities um, that I've ever seen in the market. Uh, and, and I think that uh, people that are really paying attention and really listening, I was actually paying attention to the people in the audience reacting to Thomas Healy. Um, there was a lot of head nodding. And, and I think that uh, when some of the other panelists were talking, I, I really didn't understand where they were going with some of their, their dialogue and, and, and what point they were trying to make. I really think they were trying to do a lot of skirting of the issue. And, and I think that really shined through. I think uh, Thomas Healy was very, very succinct. I thought he was very to the point. And uh, we're going to kick in here and uh, allow Thomas Healy to provide the, uh, the intro, and then we'll walk through each of the six sessions uh, at the ACT Expo, which I found was just a, a real pivotal milestone uh, for Hylion in really putting this product to the forefront uh, in front of big industry. And I, I thought it was just absolutely intriguing. Hope you guys enjoy. Our mission is to be a leading provider of electrified powertrains to the commercial vehicle space. I've had the pleasure of meeting with most of you over the, the past few years here at the ACT Expo, but uh, it's exciting to see how much this show has grown. I think we hit record attendance this year, and uh, for us, this was a, a huge trade show for us. It was the first time that we unveiled our new and improved hybrid system for Class 8 semi-trucks, as well as it was the first time that we actually publicly unveiled and let people see firsthand, up close, our Hypertruck ERX. Uh, we had the uh, interesting experience of announcing a new product through the middle of COVID. Um, so we were super excited that you guys actually got to see it here at the show. But, you know, the reality is, is the way we look at this whole electrification shift is it's happening, but we need to do it in a way where it's going to be easy and practical for fleets to adopt. And, uh, and so for Hylion, we see it as there's not a one size fits all solution. And uh, we're going after the long haul class eight market specifically. And we see that for that market, you really need range extender solutions. Uh, and a few others on the panel here are also bringing forward range extender solutions. Uh, but you know, the, really the question is, how are those batteries getting charged? How are we actually producing the electricity? Where's the electricity coming from uh, to actually be able to drive that vehicle? For us, we're taking an approach of starting with natural gas as a fuel on board the vehicle and specifically using renewable natural gas, which can drive net carbon negative emissions profiles for trucks. Infrastructure is already built out, the cost already works, and the emissions already works. And it's leading, right? If you're net negative, it's pretty tough to beat that. Uh, so from that end, we see this as a great starting point for making this shift into line haul, long haul, uh, class eight electrification. And then from there, we can target a, a future. Of so a few things that Thomas uh, really just set the stage for what ended up to be an extremely telling uh, panel. It was incredible. Uh, mind you, that was the only two times that net carbon negative was mentioned during this panel. I found that extremely telling. I also thought it interesting how uh, on this panel, he foot stomped again um, the uh, version two of the hybrid product that is actually been added to the Hylion.com website. They've added an entire sequence just devoted to the hybrid version. For all of you guys that are interested in that information, I highly encourage you to kick over to Hylion.com and go into what is available now with their uh, hybrid product that they've got, their new and improved hybrid product. 
So Thomas does a good job here of really setting the stage, um, really introducing Hylian as, as the product, um, kind of a standalone here on this panel uh, with the direction of going toward uh, the solution and the fuel being RNG. I thought that was super important uh, to really distinguish himself from the group. And that way he was able to really remain kind of close to the vest during the totality of the panel. And I thought that was a really strategically smart move because he was able to define uh, Hylion's business model and, and actually kind of go on the offensive a little bit later uh, in the interview. So let's get into uh, session two uh, in at the ACT Expo at the uh, at the panel here. Yeah, absolutely. So I think the theme that every single answer has addressed here is infrastructure is the question mark. The truck technology is not going to be the question mark. I fully believe that we're going to be at a point where the truck technology is ready. We'll have BEV trucks that can do long range, but we're not going to have an infrastructure that's able to support actually charging those vehicles. Similarly, when you look at hydrogen, where's the infrastructure to actually refuel these vehicles? And that's going to take time to build out. That's not going to happen overnight. You need to get lots of permitting in order to build a station. You need to figure out how you're actually going to produce the hydrogen. And the grid in electricity generation is a real problem, right? I mean, you, Craig, you hit the nail on the head. California's already having problems keeping lights on at home, keeping your refrigerator running, let alone putting trucks on the grid. And the reality is, is if you want to electrify all the trucks in California, I was told at this show that you need to double the capacity of the grid in California in order to support that. And that's not something that's even being embarked on and worked on. You know, that's not, that hasn't taken place. So the reality is we need to be really smart about how this electricity is going to be generated. And we need to be practical about it as well, right? There was a panel that happened the other day where uh, one of the speakers was saying, well, why don't we take renewable natural gas and we will use that to actually make hydrogen? Our pitch as a company is, well, why don't you just take that renewable natural gas, just put it in the truck and produce the electricity on board the vehicle in order to drive it. And from an ecosystem standpoint, that is a much more efficient solution than going through multiple phase changes of, a, of energy in order to be able to produce electricity. So from that standpoint, our pitch is, why don't we utilize the already existing infrastructure out there, over 700 stations built out across North America for class eight trucks or for semi trucks, and utilize that to refuel the vehicles with renewable natural gas. Last year, uh, we surpassed over 50% of the uh, natural gas sold at these stations already came from renewable sources. So RNG is a real fuel source. This isn't like one or 2% of the market. And one of the fun stats out there is also there are just as many RNG production facilities being permitted and starting builds right now as are already in existence. So we're going to see a tremendous amount of RNG production coming in the near future. So just use that right on board the vehicle, produce the electricity and get all the benefits of electrification without the downsides of infrastructure. So Thomas takes the time here to address the infrastructure issue and the real contrast between Hylion and the rest of the panel members. If you do watch the uh, panel in its totality, you're really going to relate, hopefully, the way that I did with the um, lack of clarity surrounding how the other companies are going to respond, uh, the BEV uh, especially, uh, and also the lack of infrastructure on the hydrogen fuel cell. I found this extremely compelling, and it was never countered during the, um, during the debate, which this ended up kind of going there a little bit. And I think Thomas asked some real rhetorical questions aimed at striking at the heart of there is no infrastructure and there are no plans for said infrastructure improvements to even make good on the promise that these other companies are looking to put forward as a solution uh, in that you might even get there, but you're still not going to have the ability to provide a cost-effective uh, truck over there if that, in fact, is what's driving your TCO, the total cost of ownership over time, if you just don't have the electricity to provide and even if you did it would still need to be comparable or on par or dare i say cheaper uh than diesel they get into that a little bit later so let's jump into 
session three here at the ACT Expo and uh, see what Thomas Healy's got for us next. At the end of the day, customers need to be thrilled and satisfied with the technology. It needs to make economic sense for them uh, to adopt this. And that's one of the things that we can't lose sight of, right? And so from our end, as we're going through the design, the development phases of getting trucks deployed out there, it all comes back to what do the customers need to see in operations in order to make this work. Uh, we put together a fleet council with some of the leading fleets in the industry so that we actually could bring fleets along the, uh, the product development cycle with us and get their feedback along the way so that when we actually do start shipping the hypertruck out to fleets, we know that it's something that's going to meet their needs as opposed to the last thing we want to do is, uh, is deploy a product that nobody wants to adopt, right? So, you know, I think we're sitting in, the, this is actually a fascinating thing if you think about it. You've got all very young and innovative companies that are sitting here to try to disrupt and evolve an industry. And the coolest part of it, when you kind of collectively add it up, you have billions of dollars sitting on our balance sheet just on this panel alone to go make that happen. And so what's a really interesting thing is that we're all taking a little bit different of an approach. Now, I wouldn't say any of our approaches are wrong, right? The reality is, though, is that each of our approaches is going to have a market opportunity that it makes sense for us to deploy trucks. It does not make sense for, you know, uh, to put an electric truck in an area where, a fully electric plug-in truck in an area where the grid can't already support it. Or it doesn't make any sense to put a fully electric truck in a place where you have to turn on a coal-fired power plant in order to recharge that vehicle. Similarly, for hydrogen, you can't put it in an area where, you know, there isn't hydrogen production or you can't make green hydrogen, right? So we have to be really strategic on how we deploy these vehicles. And ultimately, we need to listen to our customers to see how it's going to work. And the last point on all that is we need to have solutions that can actually save fleets money. Because as you all know in the audience here, this is not the passenger car world. The passenger car world is going to make a decision on buying a car based on emotions. It's going to be, oh, I love the touchscreen in this car. The acceleration is awesome. I have ludicrous mode, right? I mean, it's all those things that that's what's going to make you buy an electric car. The reality of all the people sitting at this show, though, is that is an asset that's a revenue generating vehicle that's designed to make profit for an organization. And if we can't help them make profit and we can't be better than diesel, then we're not going to have a winning solution. So that element right there was extremely important in uh, drawing a distinction between Hylion, who has the services of the Innovation Council, um, 10 specific large fleet owners. And interesting enough, I don't really feel like the other companies are challenged enough on this front, and specific to customer integration in the process. Um, I don't uh, believe, and I don't cover the other uh, companies, uh, Hyzon, uh, BYD. I cover Nikola a little bit, but not to the point where I'm trying to substantiate an investment in the company. But to my knowledge, they don't have anything that Hylion has with the Innovation Council in that they're seeking out validation. And there was a theme throughout this panel that I felt like there was really a lot of talking around the core issue that really, I, I, I don't mean to be um, uh, impartial here, but Thomas Healy really was very crystal clear, um, very well spoken on addressing the core issues and posing those questions rhetorically which I felt like the rest of the panel failed miserably uh, at addressing and answering. There was all kinds of different ways of explaining that they were going to go out and they were going to meet customer demand. But all the while, I don't see that they're integrating their vision for the future that was used a lot, especially by Craig of Nicola, who was representing the panel here about their vision and Thomas Healy hit it on the head when he said, look, if they if we're coming up with a solution that is futile in otherwise it can't be used or the bottom dollar total cost of ownership cannot be substantiated, justified, if the efficiencies just aren't there, it will fail. And he says that outright. And the rest of the panel seemed to spend the most of the time really just talking about their vision their vision and that they're going to have to accommodate for customer needs on an individual basis. It made no sense to me. 
And I found that it was a, a real flailing by the rest of the panel here uh, when Thomas challenged them on this very front uh, customer integration. So let's jump into discussion four here and see what Thomas has got in store with us uh, in session four. Great. Thomas? So TCO is something we really need to talk about. And I'll lead into this with saying, like Craig and I were chatting about this yesterday. And the, the reality is, is like, even though all of us are sitting up here and technically we are competitors, at the end of the day, we want all of, us, all of each other to succeed here uh, because that's what's going to make this industry transition into being a, a cleaner contributor to the environment. But we really need to have an honest discussion about TCO and how we're going to make this work because there, I think there's a general perception that, you know, for, or realization from a fleet standpoint that you're going to have to hold on to assets a little bit longer so that you can really drive a payback and see a benefit from uh, having an electric vehicle. But I'll share kind of where we're approaching it from, from a natural gas standpoint. And then we've got hydrogen experts and we have BEV experts on this as well. And we got to talk about how are we going to do this? So with natural gas, we're dealing with a fuel source that already is less than the, the cost of diesel. So that allows us to increase the, the upfront cost of the truck a little bit over diesel. But then we're going to drive a benefit because you're going to use a fuel source that's less expensive uh, than, uh, than what diesel is. And that's what's actually going to get you to a point that you're you're better off than diesel. But with hydrogen and even in some instances grid electricity, we're not there today. So how are we going to get hydrogen to a point where it is less than diesel? What does that transition look like? And you know, Craig, Pablo, how are we? So doing I thought this was um, really the critical moment in the entire panel. And you guys can leave your comments at the bottom. Pay close attention to um, Nicola Rep Craig, who Thomas puts on the spot. And I don't think he appreciated it very much. Um, his response was, well, uh, that's fickle. Uh, I'm not sure what that means. But then he goes on to explain how he's not going to try to boil the ocean uh, overnight, et cetera, et cetera. Really just complete ev ev evading the question that, that Thomas posed there. And um, I, I thought that this was just a, 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 an absolute slam dunk moment. And to draw a real distinction between the Hylion uh, total cost of ownership proposition when you take the RNG fuel and you compare it to um, it being now currently the only one on the panel, I might add, less than diesel. So the total cost of ownership calculations, Thomas does allude to the potential for owning the asset longer. I don't think fleets have a problem with that. And, and I think it's brought up on the council or the, the panel in a little bit that I don't think fleets are really even that concerned with a little bit larger of a sticker price up front as long as they can have those concrete figures to understand what they're shooting for um, on the onset when they take on a solution that burns a specific fuel. Case in point, Hylion has the only fuel solution on this panel that currently is less than the cost of diesel. Some of these other um, uh, fuel sources are four times hydrogen, for example, of diesel. And Craig with Nikola does really a, a very, very poor job of saying what the target price for huge hydrogen fuel cell at $4 and that being the value proposition, interesting enough in a fairy tale world, that would just be absolutely lovely if you could actually plug the truck in. And it was interesting, the moderator who's actually with Meritor, I find that I found that extremely ironic, which for those of you who don't know and don't cover Hylion, Meritor is the replacement uh, for the Dana, Dana rear axle on their hybrid uh, and their um, their hybrid version. So they are the um, the sole distributor uh, of that. It's going to go on a Meritor axle. So I, I found that really interesting here. Real key moment here. And I, and I think he put them both on the spot. Um, I appreciated that he did it. I, I think it's part of that. Um, you know, there's a time to be nice and there's also a time to press. And as the front man of Hylion Holdings and not being a private company, um, having stakeholders and stock owners to, to answer to, uh, I found that this little bit of offensive here, and I don't think Thomas Healy meant anything by it. 
I just think that the as probing of a question as it was and how much difficulty Craig and Pablo both had in answering the question, I, I thought this was a real telling moment uh, in the entire uh, panel when the quick response was, well, that's fickle. I found that just intriguing. That's seriously your answer as a four and a half billion dollar company, that being Nikola, when the little company that could, the one and a half billion dollar company with the actual solution that holds the actual fuel that's less than diesel poses that question to you and you can't answer what your total cost of ownership calculations are going to look like, there's a reason for that, okay? That, that nobody can forecast what it's going to look like to produce, and it gets alluded to on the panel what it's going to be like uh, to transport the hydrogen. That was alluded to as being the most expensive element of this whole thing. It was said on this panel that hydrogen is everywhere. That might be true, and it is true in the world. What, what was a, an escape from the ap actual topic at hand was that hydrogen, uh, to, to, to produce it, is actually very, very difficult. So it was, it was really interesting there where the conversation came uh, for the, the TCO, the total cost of ownership, and there was just too many unknowns. And the panel had a really hard time address, addressing that direct comment uh, from Thomas Healy, because Thomas knew that he hold a, he held the aces on this very, very topic, and he had to put that out there, and I'm glad that he did. So let's rock on to topic five here, and we'll continue on here. So I'll, I'll first share kind of my biggest surprise come with this all was coming into this industry, I thought that I was going to be met with kind of people with, you know, a stiff arm of, hey, we don't want to hear it. You know, we've been doing this for a lot of years. We know how it's done. Uh, we don't need new entrants. It was the exact opposite. Uh, you know, working with you, TJ, I mean, TJ and I uh, know each other well. Like, there's an easy way for organizations that have been here for a while to also work with newcomers into this space uh, to really make an impact. And so I'd say that's the first thing that we can't lose, right? We need collaboration amongst the newcomers coming in, as well as the players who have been here who know how to get things done in this industry and do things the right way. And that's how we're going to see innovation happen. So let's not lose that. Um, but then for us, you know, it's allowed us to really position ourselves as a disruptor and innovative thought leader, which has then allowed us and the others on this panel to go out and, and raise the required capital needed to actually go do this. You know, let's just be totally honest. None of this is going to happen unless there's a significant amount of capital being put behind it to make this transition take place. I mean, these vehicles are expensive right now. The components going into them are very expensive. And that goes back to the initial comment of, uh, you know, ultimately these vehicles are going to cost more than a diesel truck to get them rolled out in your fleets. But then we need to utilize the actual cost of electricity, the cost of fuel to drive down, you know, to being less than diesel uh, in order to see a payback. And the only way we're going to hit those sort of levels of scale, the commodities of scale, is if all of us are working together to drive the cost of these components down to make it work. So it needs to be co collaborative, but I think there's an awesome mix of kind of the, the people who have been here and been doing a, for a, gr a great job for a while, combining with the newcomers like the ones sitting on this panel. So he gives a nod there to TJ. TJ's with Meritor. He was talking about how he's been received. And Thomas has talked about this on many of his interviews, how he was surprised at how accepted um, at least that legacy industry was to sit down at the table and have a real discussion. And he alludes to this all the time with what industry needs and talking about how those, um, those, those offerings were integrated into the highly on solutions going forward. A lot of my bullish thesis is surrounded around, I think Thomas is a smart guy. I, I don't think that he would dismiss uh, some of these companies that have been around for a hundred years, Meritor being one of them. And I, I don't, I don't think that he wouldn't with an open mind, sit down and listen to constructive feedback as the fleets over the last couple of years have enjoyed the hybrid product. You're seeing that very integration here. And, and I don't believe that Hylian is getting due credit 
um, for the V2 hybrid, uh, the um, the uh, the newest hybrid version that is available now through Hylion.com, and they're going to be able to offer those to fleets, realize revenue here in the back half of, half of 2021. Exciting stuff. But I just don't see that level of collaboration with industry. I see partnering with dealerships. That's completely different. That is completely different. What that tells me is that Nicola says, I'm going to build a truck and it's going to be our way. And it's going to be your job to sell that truck. Okay. The problem that I really have is that all the companies, Nicola specifically, doesn't get scrutinized on its margins. The cost of taking a truck from start to finish is significant. And the, the, the ability of and the, the, the cost that's associated with that really speaks to the highly on opportunity running more of a, of a, a capital lean business rather than a capital intensive business. The only one on the panel that I think can say that, uh, whereas, you know, the margins on the highly on products, once they ramp up uh, scale and production, a lot of the, those margin costs are going to actually fall right to the bottom line because their operating costs are, are kept significantly low operating the company right now at about 135 million. That, that's, that's nothing. That's extremely lean. Now that should ramp up over time. And I hope that it does. Um, but we want to see that mass scale integration start to take place and have them realize um, those projected uh, margins um, that uh, on the initial investor presentation was set at about 35%, which are, they are fat. So let's jump in here and we'll conclude the panel here. And then I'll offer my closing uh, comments, but uh, we'll get to the very last comment here um, in the uh, ACT Expo. And these components have a lot longer lifespan to them than what we're seeing in a conventional vehicle today, right? So in the beginning, let's be honest, there is going to be a lot of risk. I mean, we saw this when, uh, you know, vehicles 10 years ago, initial natural gas trucks came out. There was a ton of question around residual value to the, uh, value of these assets. It's going to be different with electric trucks, though. I think that's a guarantee. Big question mark is going to be the batteries, right? Do your batteries last to a point where you can actually continue to keep driving these things, or are you going to need to do a whole pack swap out? I think we're getting to to a point where batteries are starting to to last, you know, life of vehicles. So that actually kind of concluded the session, and I I went through and for you guys that are interested in catching the interview in its totality, um, please do. Uh, very very simple. You can just uh, search through YouTube ACT Expo Hylion, and it will come up. I'll throw the description down in the in the um, in the description if you'd like, or the link in the description, uh, and you guys can kick over there and catch the interview in its totality. I, I thought this was a real slam dunk. Uh, I think over the last couple of weeks, there has been one after another value proposition on Hylion with the additions to the board with the rollout and finalization of the uh, hybrid version, the improved version of that that is actually available now. And I don't think that there has been more pressure behind the dam with Hylion, uh, the stock itself. Um, certainly the company is doing everything that they need to do to um, show progress. And then finally the ACT Expo, which I wasn't sure the verdict was out for me, on whether or not this was really going to be a, a, a bullish type of uh, move for the company, what that meant, I, I really don't know. But this panel really brought it together for me. And I watched it and I, I could not believe what I was listening to. I could not believe it. And I don't want to be rude. And I also want you guys to derive a kind of an impartial opinion on some of the responses that you heard from some of the other panel members that of which we did not discuss, uh, alluded to it a little bit, but see if you can actually understand some of the responses from some of the others. I mean, there was talk of financing being the answer. There was talk of this v grand vision of infrastructure. Guys, none of that exists in reality. And that's, that's the interesting part when I look at the contrast between a Nikola that is absolutely loved by the market right now Hylion stock being absolutely hated. At the same time, I look at what, what company actually has the most chance of having its product integrated into the, the line. In other words, who's closer to mass scale production? 
there was a few comments there from Hyzon, which I thought was really telling in that they plan on delivering 200 trucks by 200, 2023. And I don't understand why those companies are given a pass in that. Nikola has had orders on the books and straight up canceled. Hylion sitting on what, 1,575 orders right now, right? Yeah. So pretty, pretty exciting stuff. 1,550, I think, is what we're looking at with the Hylion order book right now. It, very exciting stuff. Those are not small potatoes, guys. Those are huge ERX orders. And I, I just think that there has never been a better opportunity for retail investors who have somewhat of an appetite for a little bit more of a speculative opportunity, the stars are aligning. There's no doubt about it. And mark my word, when this stock gets up above where I think it should be out of extremely oversold territory, um, I could see the stock going to $20, $30 very, very quickly. I could see it going there by the year's end, but none of that matters, okay? The only thing that matters is what we talked about during the making of this coverage of the ACT Expo, real updates heard from the boss, Thomas Healy, who really looked to take that challenge sitting just feet from their competitors. And make no mistake, guys, they are in fact competitors. If you enjoy the content you got coming through here on the Independent Investor Channel, specifically these highly on videos, I love doing them. I'm a, I'm a big shareholder in the company. Very, very bullish. I don't care what the stock does day to day. I, I wasn't surprised to see that the ACT Expo churn and and the excitement around what Hylion is doing fell flat, just like every other good piece of news. Um, I do think that there's stock manipulation going on. Um, I do think that um, would-be investors in this company are being provided the opportunity of a lifetime and really piss on the market, to be honest with you, for providing this um, opportunity for 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 the market it's kind of boxing the stock into a, a corner to be honest with you because sooner or later the good news will shine through and the stock will reflect the good things that are going on with the company and there won't be such a severe disconnect um, between the stock price and what's actually going on at highly on now make sure and leave your comments at the bottom of this video guys share the message with anybody out there that you know can appreciate another highly on video and an update on the uh, ACT Expo that just happened this week. Guys, thank you so much for tuning into the message. And good luck in your investment future.